Well, it is a difficult question to judge Italian cities and the architecture because it's a very diverse field. There is the famous and beautiful historic architecture, Renaissance architecture in many of these cities. There are some cities that have beautiful historical buildings, as we all know, and some cities that have beautiful modern buildings contemporary buildings. There is a t was a time, for example, if you think about Turin, there was a time when in the 60s, 70s, when they had, or even 50s, beautiful engineering buildings, like Nervi, Lingotto, all these buildings. So it's very hard to judge. What I noticed is that some of the Italian cities are very reluctant to allow, allow contemporary architecture in their city centers. And some of them with very good reason, like Bologna, because the city centers are so intact historically. But sometimes I think little interventions of contemporary architecture would make the cities mm, more contemporary, more, more interesting. But in the last 15 years, I think a lot of interesting things happen architecturally also in Italy. Probably more in the north than in the south, but we like the cities the way they are. That's for us, uh, me being a tourist here, that's Italy and I don't expect something different. I think in Italy, is space for contemporary architecture. And they should make space for contemporary architecture. What I find interesting is, we all visit uh, architecture from the 60s, 70s. We visit architectures from the 30s, 40s, Como, for example, Terrani. We, we, we look at these buildings and we appreciate the modernism. So we would also appreciate the contemporary architecture. And if you, if you look at the green towers here in uh, Milano, people go visit them. Probably more people go visit them now than go visiting the Last Supper, yeah, because there, there is really a longing for something of our time, of each time. I think cities should develop in time culturally, and Milano did that, but also architecturally Milano did that also, but not many cities did. I would say there is no specific European architecture. If we think about Western Europe, there is probably some sort of a European international style in a way where there is a common sense or a common understanding of architecture, but it's a little bit also along the language lines. If you think about Switzerland, Austria and Germany, there is a lot of common in understanding and defining contemporary architecture. In Eastern Europe, it's probably still more oriented at the international style. But I would not say there's something specific European. And I think it's good that there is still the feeling of identity, even in contemporary architecture, that was missing in the 80s and 90s is now more finely defined again, and I think that's the right way. About the development of the European city, again, we, ha we generalize here. But I personally think that the cities will change again from business cities to living cities. Now, 
Milano is different. Milano is living and working. It's a very shared city. But if I think about some German cities, uh, like Hamburg maybe, or Stuttgart in the extreme, the city centers just became again more livable places. So the diversity or the diversion between living and working is sort of coming together again, which is a good progress, a good development. In general, I think, or I assume, that our understanding of the workplace will change. What we perceive today as big administrative places will become less workspace, more communication centers, and this will open up space for more living in the city centers again. It will become more inclusive again, and this is a good development. Ceramics are a very innovative material. It's interesting is it's a very old material, traditional material, but nowadays it's very engineered. It allows for a lot of uses we couldn't in the past. It used to be a very breakable material. It's not anymore. It's almost like glass in the meantime. So it is perfect for some purposes. And I think it's underutilized. We should use it more for facades, for example. We help ourselves still with plaster and ventilate it behind. We do very complex structures. And I think ceramics open possibilities for us architects to work here more with ceramics and in the interior, yes, for bathrooms, sure, for spas, for swimming pools. It's a natural material. It's the right material for that. We have some problem right now, especially in Germany with ceramics. The people who can lay the ceramics, mount the ceramics, are very hard to find. So it is becoming an issue that it's became very expensive. It's almost a monopoly in, in Germany, which actually hinders the development of and use of ceramics. It is a challenge where I think we all have to undertake a lot of efforts to bring that back as a profession in the market. It's, it's a craftsmanship, it's not Laying ceramics, it's not industrial, it's a craftsmanship. And we are missing the craftsmen to do it. So this has to come back to really fully appreciate the possibilities we have for ceramics. We use a lot of ceramics in our projects because we do pools, swimming pools. And that's probably a very basic way to use ceramics for the pools, for the bathrooms, the showers and everything, and the flooring, and, and everything. But we have also used it already more creatively in a spa, for example, where we used small tiles or big tiles, or even large tiles, large plates. There is always the basic use, everybody does, but I think there are far better possibilities and opportunities to use it. We architects have just to have the courage to do it. This afternoon, I will talk about, a little bit about our office, but mainly about sustainability. As we all know, it's becoming a huge issue with the younger generation. They will hold us responsible at one point, how the world developed and politics are not helping us right now to make progress here. And since the building sector is responsible for a large share of the CO2 and the pro environmental problems, I think we as architects have a high responsibility here to find the right answers. And we are just at the beginning 
of this development. We all think we, we have mastered that subject, but we are far from it. And I would like to lay out some of the problems and possible solutions and, and show some examples how we are working our way towards a more sustainable built environment. Good. First of all, who we are, you have seen the movie. I can be very quick. You have met the people already in the video. We are a rather diverse firm. Since I opened the office in 1989 or 91, when it became independent, I made a point to work with an international team. I used to live and work in the United States during my studies as an intern and was treated there very well, enjoyed it very much and wanted to give also other people the opportunity to work abroad. So I would say we are one-third Germans, one-third Europeans and one-third from wherever they come from. And it works very well for us. In our Boston office it's the same way about half American and the other half are either Europeans or international. We are one office, that's important for us, we are one office in four locations. It's not four offices, one office. And we are structured, you have seen it, in a partnership with studio directors. Now, just to open up some unfun facts. I saw this on Twitter the day before yesterday, New York Times. An expert estimates that the typical American family uses 90 gallons of gasoline every month, which means they would spend an extra $18, $18 a month as a result of the attacks on Saudi Arabia. First of all, the $18 are not the point. The point is, if you do the calculation, they blow out 783 kilograms CO2 per month. That's the 90 gallons. That's the calculation. And what are $18 compared to three quarters of a ton CO2? And then I looked at some numbers to find out, because we Germans have a tendency to think we are so green and so sustainable. We are not. We are an industrial country. We love cars. We love big, heavy cars. So the average US citizen produces 16 tons CO2 per year in 2018, down from um, 24 tons in 1970. A German is at 10 tons. An Italian is at 7 tons. The average European is at 8 tons, and I think we are responsible in Germany for the difference. A Chinese person is at 8 tons from 1.5 tons in 1980, so you see what happened there. And the world is interestingly very stable. It's five tons CO2 since 1980, pretty stable. Now that makes you wonder what happened. Well, population grew. It's very simple. We more than doubled in the time the population. That makes the difference, that for it's stable. So this is just to point out, we have to do something. The building sector is responsible for about a third of the CO2 emissions. So what can we do? Everything we do 
Every building we build, everything we buy, leaves a stamp in CO2. We cannot negate it. But how can we minimize the impact? That's what it is about. Since nine, end of 1990, 1998, when we opened our first green building, sustainable building, which was a European uh, ecological pilot project at a time when nobody used the term sustainable at all. And it was probably the most radical we ever did because we had to calculate for the environmental agency of the Netherlands the life cycle of building. And there were no catalogs of building materials, of embedded energy, so we had to calculate it. And we did it in a way to calculate costs that we say, said, how many trees do we have to plant to compensate the life cycle? And how much does this cost? Bit weird, but the only calculation we could do of environmental damage. And we found out that the average building you costs the society in environmental damage 2.5 times the construction costs over 50 years. And the goal was to bring it down to 1.5 times. And that's what that building. And then we did some more, the first lead platinum building in the United States and some other buildings throughout. But we never ever reached again the radical approach of our first building. It's probably because the Dutch are very open-minded clients. Germans are not. What is sustainability? How, when, whoever you ask, everybody has a different understanding and a different definition. The word comes, the term comes from forestry in the 18th century. Never cut more wood than grows in the same time in your forest. So it's a good approach. The last three are the only ones we usually discuss because we only discuss the quantitative aspects. Energy, kilowatt hours per square meter per year, which is a bit short because if I follow that logic, I build a building nobody uses it then I have the most sustainable building because it doesn't use any energy, doesn't make sense. So we have to look at the urban, the public realm, culture, very important, you saw in the movie, I don't explain it again, very important artifact, the cultural context, the material, the reuse of materials, what do we do with the existing building stock, how do we treat, treat nature, and then air and climate, daylight, artificial lighting, the energy components. Of I now will show a couple of ex examples to explain deeper what I mean with that. And I always highlighted what I think is somehow in these projects. So far, we never succeeded to do a project where all the aspects were taken care of. But I still have a little bit of time. So I'll talk about Portland, the Portland Miller School of Business Administration. Portland is a relatively green, sustainable city, at least they think they are. Um, and it's a very rigid pattern, grid, urban grid. This was about an existing building to be remodeled and an added wing to it, and about a public realm for the students. Here you see the situation quite well, and here you see the building. To the left, the metal box is the existing building, which we clad it new and did totally in the interior, everything we did, cut it down to the concrete structure. They had asked us first to demolish it and build it new, and we did a calculation. In the concrete structure, it's about 25% of the construction cost, but 60% of the building energy, the gray energy to build a building is embedded in the concrete structure. So why demolishing a concrete structure and build a new one there, which is pretty much the same? There's no point. 
And then we added um, the lecture rooms here. It's a concrete structure, wood cladded, with a hole in the center, which is sort of the public realm in the building. It's the space where the students meet. Another project where it's about existing building stock and artificial lighting. The house in the house in Hamburg. It's a historic building, goes back to the 18th century, has been redone a couple of times, and has a very classic historic hall. And we won a competition. My father at the time did the competition. And then he handed it over. He, he, had a, he couldn't work anymore. And we shouldn't touch the historic building, the historic, but we should almost triple the space they can use in this historic hall. And so the idea was to do a transparent building in the competition. It was all glass, very transparent, everything. Now, once you start calculating structure, fireproofing, they, there's no transparency left. And we couldn't do anything at the building. We couldn't open anything, so we had to bring everything through the doors. What you see in there is the bu biggest building element we could bring in there. And so we changed the perception from transparency to immateriality. And this is a very good example for the approach of immateriality. It's reflecting what you see, the reflection is actually the outside. So you see the outside at the inside and the inside of the outside. So really the old and the new merge. And this is, after all, 15 years ago when we designed the building. It's all in LED lighting because the idea was the most immaterial element we have is light. It's, light is nothing. Light is only the surface it, it hits, otherwise you don't see it. And so we wanted a, a building of light, but we couldn't do it with fluorescence lighting or whatever. That wouldn't have been responsible. So we found a company who did hand weld 170,000 LED lights and plates and put them in the building. And you see now we are looking up through the ceiling yeah? and you see the LED panels, a glass floor with a grid and the clumsy structure from before suddenly disappears. It's the white elements. Suddenly the building became immaterial. And it worked quite well. And you don't see that this is actually three times the area of the whole hall in the building in usable space. You don't have often clients like that that you can do something like that. They didn't come cheap. An example where we are talking about the public realm material responsibility, air, climate, and artificial lighting again. It's the Salle de Conference in Geneva. A little bit, we did the administration building in the back of this building, the blue thing there, the blue administration building. And it was a very difficult client at the time. It was the old director he didn't want, he wanted full air conditioning, no operable window, blah, 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 the whole thing. And I was constantly fighting with them. And then came the time when the United Nations, it's a department of the United Nations, went public and said, we have to do something. We have a climate problem. We have to change our building stock. We have to improve. But not we, you have to. They told we want a lecture hall, a conference center for a thousand people. Now show if you can do it sustainable. And so we designed a wood structure. It's all wood. 
structure, interior, exterior, everything is wood in there except the roof. Wood is a fantastic building material, especially climatically for a lecture hall that is in use six hours a week. It has no um, capacity to store temperature. So it, you can heat it easily, cool it down easily. It's floating. Then it's very elastic. This has a this cantilever 30 meters out. You couldn't do it in concrete or steel. You can only do it in wood because it's light. It's elastic. We had a bump blast issue. Wood is perfect because it's elastic and things like that. So best possible building material for something like that. And that's the hall. And that was the structure. The ceiling structure is two meters high. The floor structure is two meters high. The walls are one and a half meters wide. And all the voids we blow air through, they are our ducts for the air work. So they keep dry. And we didn't have to use metal for ducts and so on. The building itself is cooled in summer with lake water. We have a pipe to the, to the lake. And in winter, it's heated with a district heating. So it's a very low energy building. And what you see in there, we designed, these, we designed there the tables, the chairs, and everything. The chairs and tables just for the simple reason to get more people in, because the existing were too thick, too wide. We did the chairs with Poltrona Franc. And the, you see the Sputniks at the ceilings, the pollen. Normally in conference halls, there is all this equipment that clutters up the ceilings. And here everything is hidden in these, in these walls. And there are also the lighting, LED lighting. It's all LED lit. We, we developed the design. It was a, a design competition of five officers. We developed the design. I won't go into much detail here. But with a building which is on a rather rigid grid, optimized for wood, wooden structure, has winter gardens that are buffer zone in winter and in summer because the shading is on the outside. Has a very compact floor. It was. <laughs> The biggest challenge was to explain to the client, if you want to be sustainable, you have to cut down on your square meter usage. Because they all wanted 25 square meters of office. And was, <laughs> no, 12. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. That was the biggest challenge. It's the passive in summer, in the intermediate seasons, and in winter, intermediate seasons, and in summer, it shows how the ventilation system works with heat exchanger that we can be almost passive throughout the year with the building. And then we did the calculation for summer, winter, for, for daylight, for everything. It's funny. We architects always think we have to do these shiny, fancy renderings. They confuse more than they actually tell you. Because they, they give you the idea of it's finished, it's done. And it's not. In the end, in competitions, the renderer designs our building because we don't have the time to give them the right information. So, this is the wooden structure. It's a hollow wooden ceiling you see on the top right. And also the air is coming through the ceilings, the natural air to bring it in the depth of the building for natural ventilation. Thank you very much for your time.